humanity. And the point for the people who wanted to follow is that they should also, and this is where if I had been one of those folks, I would have backed up and said, whoa, they should also be willing to die. Now, you got to decipher all that. They have to put to death their own sinful lives. And Jesus called that, and I'm quoting his words, their life in this world. But here's the problem. If we love that life, if we love that life that this world offers, we can be sure we're going to lose it in death. But if we're willing to put that life of this world out of ourselves, out of our lives, put it to death through Jesus, then we can keep life. And that's not a contradiction, although it does sound contradictory to me. It involves a turning away from it's all about me. A turning away from serving ourselves and it's turning to following Jesus in the path that he wants to lead us down. Now, we all know how Jesus died. During Lent, we meditate upon the passion. We meditate upon the death of Jesus who was crucified, just like a common everyday criminal. And he was accused by both the religious and the civil authorities. And he died just a horrible death as an insurrectionist and as a blasphemer. Both crimes were the highest that could possibly happen against either the religious people or the civil state, the church. We know that Jesus was guilty of neither one of those, and yet that's not what the law said. He did break the law, and under the law, he died as the accused. We know that it was for our sake, our sake, friends, that he willingly submitted to this treatment through the law of God. But now, the question is, how do I, how do you, how do we follow him into death? We all know, every one of us knows, that sooner or later we're going to die. But how do we die the kind of death of which Jesus speaks? Well, Jesus made that possible. He got it through. He got it through. In baptism, think about this. In baptism, we already have experienced our own funeral. And as I read the last 10 days about all of this, this really hit home. We experienced our own funeral. In baptism, we have been put to death with Jesus. And as all of our sins were nailed to the cross with him, so they were buried with him on Good Friday. And each time we say the Lord's Prayer, we recall the funeral of our old nature, that nature that ruled by the world. And each time we come to the sacrament here at the altar, we die to sin again. Christ makes it possible for us to follow him into death through the gospel, through his word, and through the sacrament. In doing that, we can leave behind our old self. We can leave it behind every day. And every day, we can start all over. A brand new day with Him. And in so doing, we can live as those who live above, on a higher plane than what the world offers. And we live by Him through our faith in Him. And that is to begin living right this very minute into eternity and living with him forever, beginning right now. So when Jesus spoke of all of these prospects, however, things still didn't look very good. Here come these strangers who certainly must have seemed to flatter Jesus by taking the time to seek him out and to express their interest in him. And when he found, when they found him and when he said, yes, I'll speak to you, Jesus comes back with this very sober, sober appraisal 
of what's going to die, what's going to happen. He's going to die. And here he is asking these people that he's never met, doesn't know, he's asking his followers to die with him. <coughs> but the interesting thing is Jesus called that, his words, his hour of glory. Remember way back at the wedding in Cana, remember he told his mother, my hour has not come. And this is the hour, the, resurrect, the crucifixion, the resurrection. That's the hour of his glorification, and it was not there. He said the same thing a little bit later to his brother. Well, we can be sure that Jesus knew exactly what this hour was going to entail, and he knew what it was going to bring about. It was trouble. It was, he said so publicly. Hear his words. Now my soul was troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. And later we know that he did suffer agony there in the garden because of the impending trial and the crucifixion. Yet in spite, in spite of what he knew lay ahead, Jesus would not try to escape. He told them that this was why he had come. This is it. And therefore, Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your name. Jesus had come. Folks, Jesus had come to personify the very glory of God and what was to happen when he died there on the cross. It's that ugly, dark, terrible moment when all of the earth trembled and shook at the prospect of God's Son dying on that cross. But that's where the glory of God was revealed. What was revealed to bring it down to where we are and what's most important to us? What was revealed was God's love. God in the flesh died for sinners. Died for us. And John says that when Jesus spoke his brief prayer, a voice came from heaven. And the voice said, I have glorified it, meaning his name, and I will glorify it again. And what that voice meant was that God had revealed his glory the first time in the creation of Adam. That had been spoiled, though, by sin. So now God was going to glorify it again. And he was going to restore innocence and goodness to the world through his son, Jesus. And the people didn't know what they heard. Some thought it was thunder. Some thought it was an angel that spoke to him. But Jesus said that the voice had come for who? For the sake of all of those who heard it. Jesus knew what was going on. But it was for the sake of those who heard it. And there it was out in the open. And Jesus said, Now, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, Satan, will be driven out. It, it would be obvious in the death of Jesus just how the unbelief of the world can result in the cruelty of killing the holy, innocent Son of God. That is the judgment of this world that we live in. And it judged and condemned, though, not just Jesus. When Jesus was judged and condemned, the world also judged and condemned itself. The death that Jesus dies is the death the world deserves. It had judged and did, condemned itself, and the devil is rendered totally powerless. The demons are driven out of the world of the world of the people who recognize what God has done in both judging and in saving the world. So Jesus says. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, 
will draw all people where? To myself. Notice he didn't qualify which people. What adjective did he use? All people. That's so important. So, so important. It just, it, it, it goes on and on and on. Everything that's happening is for Jesus to represent God and show the love that God has for us. So, because now the devil is virtually powerless, we're able to recognize what God has done in judging and saving the world. And Jesus said, after he had said, I will draw all people to myself, he described on his, but I'm sorry, John described, it meant being raised from the dead and ascending, ascending into heaven. That's why the voice and all that Jesus had spoken was for our sake, so that there's no confusion. It was for the sake of the world. What Jesus accomplished was satisfaction for our sins, was forgiveness for our sins. And to use a word that we hear very seldom except during the Lent, for the atonement of our sins. All mean pretty much the same. One note that Jesus also spoke for the benefit of the Greeks were these words. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Jesus would have his way with us. And all that Jesus summarized in his statement to his disciples for the benefit of the Greeks, every bit of it was realistic about what was going to transpire in his life. But it was also realistic about what's going to happen in our lives. All of the benefits, all of the benefits of the death, the burial, and particularly the resurrection of Jesus Christ are for our benefit. That's good news. So, if, the follow, if following Jesus appears to be difficult because we think we have something in ourselves or the world that we can't give up, Jesus says we're going to lose it. We're bound to. Following Him through the cross, though, however, not only guarantees that we have eternal life, but that we will always live in the presence of Christ. John said it a minute ago. Christ is present with us. Right this now. Right this minute. Right now. He always is with us. And that is very, very good news. He gives us the signs of that there in the sacraments and in his gospel. But we know when we finally depart this world, we'll also be exactly where he is. And on top of that, Jesus says, whoever serves me, the Father will honor. I was very fortunate growing up. I had two grandmothers for quite a while. One of them lived here in Memphis. One of them lived in upstate New York. They both knew the same saying when somebody did something good for somebody else. And that saying was, they're going to be jewels in your crown. And I say that to my kids and to people who are nice to me occasionally because it's just something that has stuck with us. However, there may be things better than jewels in your crown. And coming from someone who plays with jewels a good bit, I understand exactly what I'm saying. But when we serve God in faith, we guarantee ourselves that God is going to honor us right alongside, right there with Jesus. Remember, he called himself what? Our brother. He called himself our friend. And we're going to be with him, and we're going to be like him through eternity. Now, to me, to me that's a whole lot better than jewels in my crown or in your crown. And that's God's gift to us, a gift of love, a gift of grace, a gift of forgiveness.
that none of us have earned or merit. It's just what God wanted to do with us, that he's